And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so incredibly honored to host internationally number one best-selling author team and brothers in real life, Lee Child and Andrew Child, here to give us the inside scoop on their brand new Jack Reacher book, Better Off Dead. Lee and Andrew, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Well, thank you, Sarah. Great to be with you and um, tell you about the book. You know, it's the 26th Jack Reacher book, the 26th full-length novel. And uh, that's as far as, you know, as far as we got, I think, when we were contemplating writing it. Okay, it's, 20, it's, a, it's another Reacher book, which is always a gorgeous feeling, to be honest, when, we, when, when we're starting it out. I, I always felt that when I was doing it myself. The, the, the blank screen is something that some writers get very uptight about. I love the blank screen because it means anything could happen. This book could be anything at all. Plus, of course, you have not screwed it up yet. <laughs> and so that is my, that's my favorite part. And um, yeah, we just had a blast writing it. Last year was our first collaboration with the Sentinel. And that was, um, I'm not gonna say difficult because it was actually a lot of fun to do, but it had two specific things about it. Number one, it was the first time we'd done it. And therefore it was a somewhat of an unknown. And secondly, because we were doing it, the idea here is that I fade away and Andrew takes over for the future. So we needed to address an issue that I had left Reacher with, which was that Reacher is hopeless at any kind of technology. And that in a way was kind of charming um, because I think readers prefer it a little bit if the hero is behind the times in terms of technology, because first of all, it means there are no easy answers. You know, you don't get some kid to move his pizza box off the keyboard and he finds the clue within two seconds. Um, it, it gives you a better story, but it also makes the reader feel less inadequate if the reader is also not totally into technology. So I was happy that Reacher was behind the times, but he was so far behind the times it, and he was falling further behind every year. So... Andrew and I, for last year, had a discussion that said we got to move him ahead a little bit in terms of technology, which Andrew handled with that plot, which was about technology, essentially. And it was gorgeous for me to see Reacher come up against stuff that he had no idea about. You know, Reacher would rather take on 10 guys with shotguns than a computer keyboard. And so Andrew maneuvered him into the future, which meant that this time, for better off dead, we could do whatever we wanted to do and put the two of us together. And it's just mad in terms of um, the ideas that can, it's like a pinwheel firework. The ideas just go everywhere. And it's really a question of um, trying to pick out the good ones, you know? I love that. I love that. Okay, well, I can't wait to hear about the pinwheel, about the fireworks, about every little bit about this. First, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching with us. We are streaming everywhere tonight, so no matter where you're watching from, Facebook, YouTube, my channels, Murder by the Books channels, our private Facebook group, wherever you're watching from, you're in the right place to hear straight from the horse's mouth, Lee Child and Andrew Child. They're going to dish it all about Jack Reacher and Better Off Dead. So if you've been here before, you you know the drill. And if you're new, here's the drill. This is your chance to talk to these incredibly brilliant authors. This is your chance to ask them about their writing process, about Jack Reacher, about anything that's weighing on your brain. So get the questions and comments going in the comment section, and I'll get them right over to these fabulous, famous brothers. Um, so excited to, to see what y'all want to talk about today. So let's get right into the process. So how does this work? Do, Andrew, do you take the first whack at the draft and then Lee, you come in with a knife and you slice and dice it up? Who, you know, do you split it down the middle? Is it page by page, chapter by chapter? What's this process look like? 
Well, you know, the way the pro process worked out was very much a result of me having to kind of adapt a little bit how I worked before because I've never been a huge planner or a huge outliner, but I always did like to have a bit of an idea where the story was going. But, you know, Lee doesn't. Lee likes to make every decision spontaneously in real time as we go along. So what that means is we can't really do anything that involves somebody having the entire manuscript because that would take too long. By the time one of us had written the entire thing to give it to the other person would have, would have used up all our time. We have to work on it together as we go. So we typically will just, you know, the most enjoyable part is the kind of the daydreaming part, the bit where we just get to talk and say, well, what would Richard do in this situation? What would we, he do here? What would the bad guy do? What if this? What if that? That part is just so much fun. We love doing that. We, we just get to hang out and, and, and kick all of these ideas around. Then comes the kind of slightly more organized part of getting it down on the page. And this is where, when we were writing The Sentinel, the pandemic kind of derailed us a little bit because we had to invent one way of working together because, you know, we'd both written books before, but neither of us was famous for really kind of playing well with others. So there was that slight question, you know, what are we going to do? And so um, we started out very much, um, you know, being able to hang out together. Then the pandemic came. So what we were doing after that is once we decided what happened next in the story would be just to simply email the document back and forth. And that would turned out to be a huge blessing in disguise because otherwise you, you can imagine what it's like, you know, you get together and one of us will have written a bit and you can't help but say, you know, this is how it connects to the last bit. This is what I think is important. This is why I think it needs to be here. This is where it's going to lead to. And then when the other person reads it, you can't unhear that. You know, you can't you can't forget it. So it, it changes the way that you respond when you read it. And that's not what happens if someone goes to the bookstore or goes to the library. They all they have are the words on the page. So once we were stopped from hanging out physically together uh, and could only email back and forth, it actually helped us enormously. So that's really how the process works. Fascinating. Okay, so every morning, do you start with a one hour deep dive? And what is Jack Reacher going to get up to? And then you say what you think. And, and, and Lee says what he thinks. And then you know, and then you, you agree or you disagree? Or does it ever devolve into arm wrestling over who gets to be right? I mean, how does this work? What about when you don't agree? Well, the first word there that I'm going to have to dispute is every morning. Um, you know, I've, I, I, I carry one inflexible belief with me, which is that nothing of value ever happens in the morning. So I, I never would dream of trying to write or decide anything in the morning. And Andrew is not exactly a, a up with the lock either. And so... We got to position that to the afternoon or sometimes the evening or sometimes midnight or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just a question of, um, of what next. But this particular book had a, had a sort of supercharged start because we had been, you know, just yakking, basically thinking what sort of a thing, you know, what, what should we do? And we had a few kind of beats or a few mood points possibly just emerging and I didn't think much more about it for a day or two <clears throat> but Andrew had had an idea for the opening that we re really can't talk about because the opening is is a big reveal in itself Andrew had had the idea for chapter one and it was one of those ideas that uh, as he just said you know to explain it author to author kind of short circuits the drama so what he did was partly to check it would work and partly because it was the only way to do it. He, he wrote that first chapter um, without me knowing and sent it to me. <clears throat> and uh, I thought it was just fantastic. I remember it well. Uh, my phone dinged. There was email coming in. Uh, it was from Andrew with the chapter one attached. And I read it and I thought, oh, my God, this is what a great first chapter. This is going to kill people stone dead to, to read this chapter. And so, in a way, that was like a kickstart to the whole project because we had chapter one 
And if you've got chapter one, then the rest of the book gets that much easier because you, you can see what you're going to do, at least for the next half a page or so, according to my scheme. And so it really accelerated the process and it, it kind of gave us, uh, it focused it immediately. You know, the, we had this great opening, now what? But yeah, basically all the way along, it was like, now what? And I was constantly disappointing Andrew because he'd be thinking, he, he'd be thinking I had some idea up my sleeve for the next bit. And he'd say, okay, what happens now? And I would say, I don't know, let's, let's wait and see. <laughs> Uh, so that's we just sort of bumble through it like that, and oh, I love that. you know I could mount a solid literary intellectual defense to that. I think that um, the organic quality of storytelling is essential. I think mm. that um, it sounds kind of lazy in a way to just say I would just make it up as I go along, but actually mm. it's not. It's really the story is telling itself. It's as if we are not in charge of the story, but merely witnesses to the story. And that really, it always helps me, you know. It helps me to the most trivial level. If somebody doesn't like it, that's not my fault. Richard did it, not me. But, you know, having, having observed it um, I, and, and having tried it different ways in the past, I really think that it that there's, the, there's such... Uh, a value to it because it's not that there's less planning involved. It's certainly not that there's no planning involved. There's there's just as much planning. It's just that it doesn't all take place up front. You know, it is distributed evenly throughout the process of writing. You know, a lot of people break their writing down into the research phase, then the outlining phase, and then the drafting phase, and then the editing phase, and so on. But with this, it's really all of those things all happening all at the same time, because um, every 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 afternoon, every day, we would have, be having to think what happens next, what happens next. And what happens as a result is that you don't wind up wedded to, you know, to an idea that you came up with six or nine months ago that seemed like a good idea at the time when you were miles away from the minutiae of the story. But then once you're writing it and you're up close and you can see that nine months ago you thought going right was the way to go, but actually going left is far better. You know, it gave it meant that every decision we made was made at the best time for the best outcome, I think, having having tried it different ways. So I think it's a, it's actually a, a really good way to work. What you have to have is confidence that you're going to get to your destination. You know, it's a little bit like setting out on a tightrope without the safety net of the outline. And um, I think often, you know, if you look back at the, the, the first 24 reaches, you can feel that kind of confidence in the writing because you have to be confident. You have to believe that you're going to get to the other side. And that's something that uh, I've had to really sort of embrace as a result of our, of our collaboration. Ooh, I am loving the energy of this writing and the insight into your process and your collaboration. This is so cool. Jim Bessie is saying he loved chapter one. Jim, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much. So, uh, Andrew, we salute you on that fabulous chapter one. Jim, tell us what you loved about chapter one. I know what I loved about it, but tell us what you loved about it, Jim. Gail is saying, hi, Sarah, and Murder by the Book. Joining us from Massachusetts, top community member there. Gail, always a delight to have you. Thank you so much for being here. We oh we have uh, Melissa Watson joining us from Australia saying hi Sarah Lee and Andrew Melissa all the way from Australia thanks so much for tuning in thanks for all the hearts up on Facebook y'all I see I got all my screens going Leecha Haney saying hello from Texas to Sarah and the gentlemen Leecha great to have you welcome. Uh, we have Yasmin Ango, welcome debut author who I hosted uh, on Monday this week, whose work has been likened to the Incredible Child team. Yasmin, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Great to have you. I'm coming through the comments so I don't make sure, miss anybody's uh, comments. Jim is saying he's reading dead now. He's almost finished. So this conversation is very interesting. Jim, totally. Let us know. Um, um, if you have any questions for these incredible authors, Melissa asking, at the risk of looking silly, are they brothers? 
are I, I, yes they are melissa these two strangers are indeed brothers um now let's talk about the fact that y'all are brothers so what happened to you guys growing up that you both became mystery and thriller writers did you have a chilling childhood <laughs> <laughs> I shall mean... we thank your parents <laughs> You know, seriously, the, the 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 obvious answer to that is we became mystery and thriller writers because we became mystery and thriller readers. Uh, you know, nobody ever does anything without having been a reader first. And so then, of course, the question is, why did we become mystery and thriller readers all those years ago? And, in fact, separately. You know, it's two separate occasions because... The, uh, the thing about us being brothers, we are absolutely biological brothers. And um, I know that for an absolute fact, because my mother went to the hospital pregnant. And um, w w a week later, we went and picked her up with Andrew. So I know that that is an absolutely true. But of course, he was uh, much younger than I was. I mean, by really not an actual generation. And I, I do, I'm going to point out that many times people have, I, we were together at Bouchercon one time and uh, somebody came up to me and said, oh, hey, good to see you. I just met your son. <laughs> and, um, you know, that doesn't work for me, but he, he's a much younger brother. And so uh, we had, it wasn't that we were sort of growing up together. We grew up sequentially. Um, so that literally before, when Andrew was 11 months old, I, I remember this very well, little tiny baby, 11 months old. Um, that particular weekend, I went to a party that lasted all weekend. Uh, I smoked my first joint. I lost my virginity. All of this stuff, I was grown up before Andrew turned one. That's and quite so, a party there, Lee. Wow. It was, it was the greatest weekend of my life, i got to tell you. Um, so the, the age gap meant that we have none of that baggage, absolutely zero baggage based on, I, I'm sure lots of people listening have got siblings, and I know that a lot of them get along really well. A lot of them don't. All of them have that hidden thing she she tore the head off my doll when she was two or this or that you know what i mean those petty resentments that get in the way we never had that uh, absolutely not we're we're very close because we're biologically similar but we are actually just friends there's no brother component to it in in that old fashioned traditional sense like i've got with my other brothers that were much closer to me in age they're the ones that annoy me. Andrew was a bonus. You know, it's been great. Well, do you hear that, Andrew? You were a bonus. Yes, yeah. fantastic. Okay, Leecha would like to know, um, back to when you said that you feel that you are not creating the story, you are bearing witness. Do these characters talk to you? Um, let's hear from both of you. And if they do, have you had to change something in the story because of it? Great question, Leecha. Get the scoop, guys. I'll let Andrew go first on that. Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't exactly say that they that they talk to me. Um, I think I'd be very worried if I if I was hearing you know hearing voices in my head and along those lines. But you know, once you come up with a character, you know, you spend a long time thinking about them, um, wondering what they were like, wondering what it would be like if you knew them as real people. And so sometimes, I guess you do find when you're writing a scene, when you're, especially if you're not planning it too far in advance, and you are asking yourself over and over, what happens next? What happens next? Yeah, sometimes the story and the characters that drive the story will take an unexpected turn for sure. But we, um, we tend to not go back and change things. You know, we tend to commit because I think that, you know, one of the things you get with, with, re with a Reacher book is that there are no shortcuts, there are no, there's no cheating. You know, a little bit like Lee was saying about the technology, you know, we, we don't have a thing where, you know, 
there's, there's a supercomputer that has the answer to everything that you can find out the combination to a door or somebody's address or something. Reacher has to figure it out. Same, you know, in the same way that he doesn't have a sidekick who's got a photographic memory who can just instantly reel off any required fact, you know. You, Reacher has to work for everything in the book. And so do the other characters. So if we are in a position where we think, oh, you know what, if that bit we wrote three days ago, if we'd have done it differently, then this new scene would be easier. That's just tough. That's our problem. We've just got to work through it. We don't go back and then change stuff for, for really any reason. Um, so I don't know. That, that, that's how I feel about it anyway. What yeah, I, think, I think when writers talk about the characters taking over or the mm. characters talking to you, that's something I completely understand. It's a sort of shorthand, actually. Mm. What they're really saying, and I've been in this situation many times, to, to get it exactly right, you need 100% in the zone. You've got to be mm. completely committed to the story in that moment. And if it's not going well and there's something happening that you just are not happy with, the characters seem to be refusing to do it, but what it really is, you're not in the zone. You're only 95% in the zone and you're missing something. Ooh. And that has happened to me a few times where I'm struggling with the scene, it's just not working. And I realize I'm just not thinking hard enough. I'm not living it. And um, so it's really inattention. It's your subconscious prodding you and saying, Pay attention. It's but we talk about it. The characters taking over because that's a sort of convenient shorthand. But I'm sure every writer gets into that same situation, where some days are just a breeze. You're just fabulous. Some days you're struggling because you're not really all the way there. Yeah. Well, the other thing that can happen, I find, is that it's your subconscious warning you that you're about to make a mistake and it's stopping you from, from going down the wrong path. You know, I had a in my first book years ago, I remember I was really looking forward to a scene that I was going to write the next day. It was one of those days where you finish knowing what's going to come next and it's really, it's a lovely feeling. And it, it was a doubly lovely feeling because it was going to be dialogue because, you know, I started out in the theater. I love dialogue. It's my favorite thing to write. So I thought it was going to be the best work day ever. But when I sat down at the computer, I could not write a single word, not a single word. So rather than the character talking to me, it was like the character was refusing to talk to me. And I would, drove me crazy until, you know, I gave up in the end. I went to get a cup of coffee. And while I was fiddling with the coffee machine, it struck me that this conversation was going to take place on the guy's cell phone. And I remembered two or three days earlier, there'd been a scene where he'd been in a fight and he'd lost his cell phone. So it was my subconscious stopping me because how could he be having a conversation on a cell phone when he didn't have one anymore because he'd lost it? So then I realized what the mistake was. I went back, I wrote another, an additional scene where he acquired a new cell phone and then the words just flew, you know, they, they just poured out onto the page. And it was, I, then I was amazed and it stuck with me always after that. You know, you've got to listen to your subconscious because sometimes it is warning you, stop because you're going to make a mistake here. You're going to go down a blind alley and much better to stop and not do that than it is to do it and then have to unpick it all and change it later. Ooh, fascinating. Now, what about those hard days, though, as a writer, when um, when Dean Koontz was on, he said he has his breakfast. He was very specific. He does not eat carbs because carbs slow you down. He said he just has he gets his butt in the seat at 7 a.m. and he does not get up until 5 p.m. And if the words aren't coming, he doesn't give himself the break. He doesn't give himself that grace. He he sits there until they come, no matter how painful it is. Sadly, uh, I, for many reasons, I am not, I, I'm no Dean Koontz. I, I get up and go away. What about you guys? What about on those days the words aren't coming? Do you sit there, gut it out? Do you walk away, go get that coffee? Or do the words just always come for you? Uh, you know, it's such a, such a variable thing. I mean, I love Dean and I, um, again, the 7 a.m. thing just fills me with dread and horror. But to, and um, one practical thing that I've uh, that I've noticed, and I would give as practical advice: only write when you're hungry. Um, 
I've been in some kind of creative business basically all my life. And in the past decades ago, anecdotally, I noticed that I worked better when I was starving. And I just thought, that's me, you know, it's just an idiosyncrasy. But then I stumbled across some scientific research that shows now, when you are hungry, the creativity section of your brain sparks up because it's an evolutionary response. If you're hungry, your brain is, is trying to figure out a really good, smart way of capturing the next woolly mammoth so that you can eat. Hunger sparks creativity. It's physically proven in the brain. And I felt really reassured by that. You know, I'm not nuts. It's actually a scientific fact. So that's what I would say. First of all, do not start at 7 o'clock. <laughs> and um, don't have breakfast. Just be hungry. Be on edge. Um, and I drink a lot of coffee and smoke a lot. And my typical writing state, I'm just teetering on the edge of having a stroke the whole time. And to me, that's the way to do it. And then, yes, yeah, some days are, some days, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. And ironically, what people would consider the easy parts, you know, if you had a big scene in, in town A, and Reacher has got to get to town B now for the next clue or whatever. Getting him from A to B is actually the hardest part of writing. It, it, and people say that, you know, getting your character from one room to the next. To do that briefly, succinctly, is difficult. That's the hardest part. So it sort of depends what you're trying to do that day. But some days are much better than other days. And I would go along with... Uh, with Dean a little bit, don't quit, you, you sit there. And it, it, if all you write is 200 words, then at least that's 200 more than you had when you started. Um, a great day, you'll rip through two or 3,000 words with no problem at all. Um, but you just gotta meet whatever comes along. And hopefully it'll all be easy days, it inevitably won't be, but you'll struggle through the bad days and you'll make it up later. And what about you, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you've, you've got to accept the fact that not every day is the same, um, you know, and uh, similar to the research about be, being creative when you're hungry. I remember years ago reading something, a theory, you know, who knows if it's true, because I don't know how brains work. But this guy had a theory that if you imagine the brain being a bit like an onion, you know, with with lots of, la you know, layer after layer after layer, the part in the middle is the older part. You know, there's more of that as, as humans evolve, the layers on the outside, there are fewer of them. But those are the smarter bits. Those are the really good bits. And your brain has to manage its resources. It's not going to allocate those newer, smarter, better bits to any old problem. So it's going to start off by trying to solve any problem you're facing with the older, more plentiful part. And it's only when that part is a, has to admit, no, I can't do this. Then the, whatever manages your brain kind of reluctantly says, fine, OK. Okay, then we'll we'll bring in the good bit. You know, we'll we'll, we'll give it a crack at the problem, and um, you know that was something that actually made me feel much better because I would have loads of times where I would be stuck with a problem, and I'd be racking my brains and I could not figure out a solution to it, and I was getting more and more and more frustrated to the point where I was ready to start, you know, bashing my head on the table, and then eventually the idea, the answer would come, and I'd be frustrated. Why did it take me so long to figure that out? And I realized, well, that's just the way your brain works. You just have to sometimes go through the frustration in order to get to the answer. Um, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the, of the mental rainbow. And um, writing days are like that. There'll be days where you, you just are stuck, you're frustrated, you're annoyed, but you have to power through it. And um, you have to just trust that the, that the solution will come, but it won't come if you give up. You know, it won't come if you, if you stop trying. You have to keep trying to solve that problem. So um, as long as you're not too strict with yourself about sticking to word counts or anything like that, you know, I like what, what Dean says about may, counting the hours in the chair rather than necessarily counting the words on the page because that's probably a better reflection of, of the work that's gone in. You know, the words will come or they won't, but they, nothing will happen if you're not there trying to make it happen. Ooh, I love that. 
Let's get over to some more questions. Wilmer would like to know for Lee, which book uh, has been the most difficult for you to write? And I'll add, and why? Well, uh, I, I really would, I should say they're all difficult and I, I struggle mightily for my art, but um, that would not be true. Some of them have been an absolute breeze and none of them have been difficult. Um, one of them, there was one called 61 Hours, which, well, there's two actually, 61 Hours and Bad Luck and Trouble, because I'm very conscious, obviously, these are thrillers. I understand the, uh, the audience's need for diversion, for, for pace, for suspense, for intrigue. I completely believe that it is the author's job to power the reader through. It's like you have the reader on the end of a chain and you pull him through the story. It is all down to me. And so using that, the, the speed, the pace, you, the book always looks like it's gonna be too short. And I, I always felt, was prey to that, that fear that I was burning through stuff so fast and the book was going to be too short. And um, yeah, both of those books were threatening to be too short. Um, so, and I did not want to shortchange the reader. You know, I think that's a real drag for a reader. If you're, if you're used to buying a book that thick, and you've done, ten, you've read 10 of those and you've loved them. And then the next one comes along and it's thin. You, you feel a bit betrayed or cheated. And so I was determined not to deliver a short book. So with Bad Luck and Trouble, I, I had to invent an entire, they were in California. The, the basic story was set around LA. And I, I invented an entire side trip to Vegas in order just to make it long enough. And um, ironically afterwards, practically everybody said, oh, I love that bit in Vegas, which was like not supposed to be there at all. And then 61 hours, the same thing happened. It was a snowbound town. I wanted a kind of locked room feel. Nobody could get in and out because of the blizzard. And that book wanted to be short too. And, and for that one, I already had the title, 61 hours. I knew it was going to be the title. And... But I never referred to it like that. If my wife said, how did it go today? Um, or how's it going? And I, I, I say, I'm calling it the book that wants to be too short. <laughs> because it just fought me the whole way. Amy B. Cher saying, I love this honesty. Yes, Amy, amazing author there. So great to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much. She's saying she loves this honesty. I think we all do. Thank you guys for being so real and so transparent with us. Andrew, any um, what's been what's been your hardest book to write and why? Well, you know, they've all been they've all been difficult in different ways. And um, that really surprised me because everything else that I've done in my life. I've done it for the first time and it's been really hard. And then the second time it's been that little bit easier. And then the third time it's, you know, it's been easier still until you really get the hang of it. And I thought it would be the same with writing, but it, it turned out to be completely different. You know, I wrote the first book and there were various challenges involved with that one, but I thought, well, good, because I've learned from it and the second one will be easier. It wasn't but it was difficult in different ways. And same for every subsequent one. So I came across a cliche ages ago that somebody said that you never actually learn how to write a book. All you do is you learn how to write the book that you just finished writing. And um, there are certain things you can learn from it. You know, like if you, if you hit a problem, you know, take a step back and say, you know, is the reason you can't write today that you're going down a blind alley and you need to pull back and fix the problem? There are things like that. You can say to yourself, yeah, I've done it before, so I will somehow get to the end, even if you can't see quite how you're going to. But each book has its own unique set of set of difficulties. And, uh, you know, I suppose that in itself is something that's useful to learn because then when you start on the next one, you know it's going to bite you somehow. Um, you're just not quite sure how or when or where. Ooh, okay, okay. I love that. And I love what you said. You never really learn how to write a book. You learn how to write the book you just wrote. That is <laughs> tremendously reassuring <laughs> for me and I'm sure so many. Um, thank you 
thank you for this authenticity and for this honesty. It's just this, I'm loving the energy of this conversation. Licha is saying how awesome that the brothers are authors and write together. Um, is it awesome? Does it feel reassuring? Have you ever had a, a, a knockdown drag out fight where you don't talk for three days? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean it is it is it is absolutely awesome for me um, because I was uh, you know isolated in my family originally and felt like I didn't belong. And Andrew coming along, even though he was so much younger than me, he wasn't immediately of any use. He was clearly he was clearly like me. And actually, within a very few years, when he was a young kid, we had this bizarre kind of. Um, Hacked in a way that because uh, he was suffering the same thing I'd suffered 15 years before, you know, this dull upbringing with these re restricted and, and repressive parents. And I could see him suffering and I knew exactly what he was going through, obviously. And we had this kind of weird pact where, you know, I was like 20 something and I said, I'll watch your back. And he was a five year old basically saying, I'll watch your back. <laughs> and we did, you know, that's how, that's how it worked. And so to work together is um, brilliant. And I, I would not have been able to do it with anybody else because it is writing is such a individualistic, personal thing that to reveal yourself to another person in that draft mode is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, but... I can do it with Andrew because we're very close. And so, and also, you know, we've hung out a lot. We've had a lot of fun. We've done crazy things together. But actually to be working together is, um, it, it's, a, it's a privilege. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I would I would say the same. You know, I remember years ago when uh, you, you know Lee was already well established, and I still was working in the telecommunication industry. But I was harboring these kind of you know these you know when you you first start thinking, well, maybe it's crazy, but you know maybe maybe I could do that. Maybe I could be a writer. And I would hear about how he'd been to Boucher Khan or any of the different festivals. And I'd imagine, I'd think, God, wouldn't it be fun if we could both go to something like Boucher Khan together? And, in, you know, years later, we were lucky enough that we could. But the trouble was, it wasn't really me going to Boucher Khan with him. It was me plus 2,000 other people going to Boucher Khan with him, you know. And if we even tried to get a cup of coffee together, you know, probably we had no chance. So this it is just literally the two of us. And it's, it's wonderful from that point of view. It is. It, take, it takes the loneliness out of it. I mean, that's the only negative that I've ever found about writing is that it is, um, by definition, lonely. You're sitting by yourself for hours, hours, you know, for months of the year, just, uh, just on your own. And it's even worse because you really can't expect anybody else to care or understand what you're going through that day. <laughs> um, you know, I've had days where... You just you've got two choices of word, and it's going to be so important. Which word? Uh, where does the comma go? Should we split that into two sentences? These stupid things that we obsess about, you have to generally keep private. Um, nobody else can share that stress. But um, when you're writing with an obviously another writer, you can. They they are in exactly the same boat, and especially with Andrew, who's married to a writer, Tasha Alexander. That, that means when I'm over there, there's three of us in the house who know exactly what we're all going through. And that is terrific, actually. It is, it is a real therapy and a real support. But I love that. I love that. That must be so wonderful because, yes, I fear that I am boring people with, <laughs> with my own struggles over, over word yeah. choice. Uh, Jim says he's having trouble with Den Doctor. He's quite – Den Docker, excuse me. Um, he's quite an odd duck. <laughs> I, <laughs> any, any comments on that, <laughs> guys? Well, Risha had a little trouble with him too. And um, so, yeah, that's far for the course. Um, I, I, I loved the, uh, having Dan Donker as the bad guy. Um, Andrew chose the name based on a, a time on a tradition that I had established, which is that um, if I'm stuck for the name of a character who is vaguely on Risha's side, I'll use a soccer player from Aston Villa, who is my team. 
if I'm stuck for a character name for a bad guy, I'll use somebody else. And um, Dan Donker was a soccer player for a team that had just beaten my team. And so Andrew picked, up, picked, up, picked that up and I thought it was a great name. And um, I have this particular, I, I'm very onomatopoeic with names and words. And I love Dan Donker because to me, it sounds like you've just pushed him down the stairs. That is the noise he would make as he tumbled. And uh, oh. so I thought it was great. And the character I thought, uh, and this is one of the strength that Andrew's going to bring to the series. His characters are pretty subtle uh, compared to mine, I think. And so we have a really good portrayal of a bad guy here, but it, there's always a question, how do you pitch the bad guy? You know, how bad is he? How, how appalling is he? And so on. And we want to, both of us feel we want to keep it plausible, realistic, somewhat limited. You know, this is a big fish in a small pond. He's a real bad guy, uh, but he's humanly comprehensible. Uh, you know, he's not faceless. It's not like we're battling the KGB or it's not like we're taking on Wall Street or something massive and faceless. It is an identifiable human. And so that gives us the, the luxury of just kind of... Uh, we can design him to be exactly the sort of person that we would hate. And that is where being brothers is very useful because we get irritated by the same kind of people. And um, I mean, I'm literally a thousand times we've been hanging out somewhere and seen some asshole doing something. And I, he looks at me, I look at him, just a glance. It's like, yeah, you know, this guy would would be going down if he was any closer to our table. <laughs> and, um, so we try and make the character uh, live those things that annoy us because then that gets us really wound up, which means that Reacher then has a plausible reason to, to get involved, you know, a high temperature emotional response to get involved. And the only way to do that is to make it very personal. So the things that annoy me and Andrew are always going to show up in the bad guy. Ooh, I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. Jim saying, wow, exactly this. Yasmin, yes. Um, so cool to get the behind the get to get the behind the scenes scoop on how you do your bad guys. You pick who annoys you. <laughs> I love that. Um, Leisha said, thank you so much, Lee and Andrew, for answering my questions about your characters talking to you. I love your answers. They are so very interesting. I totally agree, Leisha. Thank you so much. Wilmer would like to know, do you think Jack Reacher will ever settle down in the future? Yeah, what's what's gonna happen to Jack? Well, that's going to be increasingly up to Andrew. <clears throat> but what I always figured is, um, you know, there's two aspects of that question. If he did settle down, then effectively that's the end of the series because so much depends on the, the, the mythic uh, foundation for this story, that the, the noble loner, the mysterious stranger shows up in a town and the town has a problem, the stranger fixes the problem and rides off into the sunset. That is the basic mythic legendary foundation for Reacher type stories. And so the mobility, the, the, the arriving and leaving, the short term uh, residence wherever is super important. So if he were to settle down, then it would ruin the series. But on his behalf, I've always wanted him to settle down because that is, I think, the central tension in Reacher, that he is a solitary man who is very happy with his solitude, but simultaneously worried about being lonely. And that tension really drives him. He's quite keen to get to the next place just in case there's somebody he can have a conversation with, even if it's only 15 minutes in a diner. He's hungry for that kind of thing. And especially if he blows into town and there's a woman he likes, then, you know, that's even better. But he's always kind of yearning for connection, simultaneously being scared of connection. 
So whether or not he's going to, how that will develop in the future is, is down to my brother. Well, I think it would be lovely for the character, absolutely. I mean, I would, you know, I've had so much enjoyment in Reach's company over the years that you kind of almost want to reward him. But you'd have to look at how that worked with the stories because it would absolutely be the end of the series because, you know, we all, everybody, certainly me, when you're thinking about picking up a, a Reacher book, you know that either Reacher will be right there on page one, already dragged into some new thing, or you'll see a problem developing and you know that Reacher's going to appear and get involved and sort that out. You know, so the arriving part is, is kind of obvious. You know, it's obvious why that's important. But actually, to me, the leaving part is, if not as important, maybe even more important because, you know, you imagine a, 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 you can make up any scenario where, you know, you're in a town, there's a problem, Reacher arrives, Reacher fixes the problem. What if he didn't go? You know, if he moves in next door to you and, you know, every time you see him, there's weirdness because, oh, look, there's the bloke who fixed the problem. You know, do I have to buy him a coffee now? You know, that kind of, it would, it would change the dynamic completely. And we don't kind of, I think, appreciate it quite as much when you think of the, like, the Western version of Reacher who rides off on the horse because we don't live in those towns and we don't have horses, you know, so it's, it's not the same for us. But if, if now that he's in our world, um, if, he, if he wound up as your neighbor, that would completely change it. It would ruin it. So, um, you know, maybe one day Reacher might just kind of leave town and then, you know, settle down somewhere. But it can't be anywhere connected to any of the adventures that he has because otherwise it would completely spoil the effect. Interesting. Interesting. Wilmer, thanks for the great question. And I love getting this uh, completely interesting and behind the scenes perspective on the answer. Thank you, Lee and Andrew. Here's one comment I missed earlier. Yasmin saying uh, she really resonated with what you said about writing in the zone. Um, I really loved that as well. And um, and another one, um, Amy saying this was so it was so fascinating about the hunger. So uh, Lee, do you not do you not eat all day then until you're done writing for the day or do you allow yourself a little sustenance? Uh, well, my diet is a horror story, really. It's, uh, Just the uh, coffee and the cigarettes? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically all my food groups begin with C, uh, cannabis, cigarettes, coffee, champagne, whatever. But I usually, uh, yeah, I don't, eat, I don't eat until later. And then it's usually some hor horrendously sugary thing that gives me a hit <laughs> that'll get me through the next couple of hours. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I do strongly believe that you write better when you're hungry. But no, everybody should listen to that advice. Nobody should listen to my advice on what to eat. That's for sure. Well, it sounds like a rollicking good time at your house, Ali. Uh, <laughs> Melissa is saying this is so fascinating and interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Leecha would like to know, okay, so this is Jack Reacher 26. How many books have you each uh, written separately? Uh, separately, I did 24 reaches and they did a, uh, a volume, you know, novel length volume of short stories about Reacher, but I don't really count that as a novel. So I did 24 novels uh, and that is, that is all I've written in terms of fiction. I've contributed to, um, you know, nonfiction occasionally, um, like documentary books or something. And I've written a bunch of forwards and essays and stuff like that. But in terms of novels, uh, what you see is what you get, 24 reaches. And how about you, Andrew? You also write under the name Andrew Grant, uh, Mr. Grant. How about you? Yeah, I've written um, nine. Before I started working with Lee on, on Reacher, I wrote nine, uh, nine novels under, under that other name. And I guess... Um, trying to count, I think only three short stories, something like that. Um, so um, I'm a little way behind. Very cool. Leecha would like follow-up question. Let's talk about your research. So have, um, have you had to do a lot of research for your books? Um, and have you ever had a weird experience while doing it? Well, I would say, I mean, there's two answers to that. There's the, the flippant answer, which is that I do no research at all. Um, and the, the pretentious answer is, for a writer, your whole life is research. 
And that is really the, uh, the key issue because we're doing, we're doing a book a year, which is actually not a horrendous schedule. I mean, these days I know that lots of people do four or five books a year, uh, you know, especially in the self-publishing area and so on and so forth. And certainly I know that in the past, and I've met some of these guys, you know, these old the people that were just really old at the time I was starting, they came from a pulp generation that literally would, could write 30 or 35 novels in a year. Uh, you know, shorter, obviously, than we do, but um, the whole landscape changed. You know, pulp fiction was, was a, a mill. It was a production line, and um, productivity was way higher. And so we're in that one-year zone, which... I don't want to make out it's terrible. It, it, it beats being a coal miner, that's for sure. But being uh, doing a book a year, the problem with researching for that book is that the research that you do is going to be undigested. It's going to be, all of it is there. And you've got to think of it as an iceberg. If you were to think about it for three to five years, you would quickly see that a lot of it is not, not any use to you. And it's only the bit at the top that is of use to you. And you've had time to digest it and percolate it and figure out what counts and what doesn't count. And if you try to do that in the same year that you're writing it, it'll never work. It'll all be too shiny and new. And th there won't be that differentiation between what matters and what doesn't. So what I always did, and happily, Andrew is uh, exactly the same and happy to work the same way, we depend on what we already know. You know, some fascinating thing that you read last year or 10 years ago, some fascinating thing um, will either be directly helpful to you or laterally helpful to you. It'll be something that happens in one sphere and you can translate it to another sphere. And you've had those 10 years or five years or one year to really think about it. And, and so what you're going on is now by definition important because you've remembered it, it's boiled down to this. So I'm a strong proponent of not doing research for this year's book. Um, I mean, sure, if there's a trivial thing, how many miles is it from one place to another? How many bullets does this particular gun have? Sure, you're gonna spend two, two seconds looking that up, but nothing major. It's gotta be what you already know, what you've already felt and feelings, are feelings are a thing that you can research and i think we do it sort of instinctively but we could stop and and do it more deliberately mm. um, for instance you know i'm a parent uh andrew's a parent anybody who's a parent has had that experience where you're at the mall and it's crowded and you you look over there because there's some kind of sale going on or something <laughs> in that store window you look over there for a second you look back and your kid is gone you you can't see your kid and you feel that insane split second of dread and panic and then you look the other way oh there she is right and, and so it's not a drama at all but what you've got to do is remember that feeling and you've got to mine it, you've got to store it up, you've got to mine it, you've got to exploit it later. Because later you could be writing a book about somebody's kid who really is kidnapped. Mm. And you've got to have the emotional authenticity to back that up. And so you've got to go back to that split second feeling you had, and you've got to say, suppose that lasts for a week or a month. Mm. Yeah, how would that feel? Ooh. Leach is saying, thank you. She said, wow, that makes so much sense about the research. Thank you both. for Thank you so much for answering my question. Um, I love that. Let's get over to some of the um, questions which were, which were submitted in, uh, in advance. Um, this one from the Mystery and Thriller Mavens group. Which of your characters from this book or any book would you like to be stranded on a desert island with and why? Well, Andrew, yeah. let's, let's hear from both of you. 
<laughs> Andrew, let's hear from you first. Go ahead. Well, you know, honestly, I would I would like to be stranded on an island with Richard because, um, first of all, I wouldn't have to be involved in, you know, like really long, in-depth conversations. Um, I think, you know, we could get to the point pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, if anybody from any rival islands came by trying to steal our coconuts or whatever it might be, then, uh, you know, Richard could quite easily take care of that. My first thought was to pick out probably one of the women from one of the previous books and because I love the women characters because, you know, I'm sitting there with, um, I'm going to be sitting there for six months writing this book and Reacher is the main character, obviously, but there will be, what, you know, the main supporting character and she's usually a woman and smart and cute. And um, so, and I love spending time with them. So given the choice, I would say I'll take one of them but yeah, when I thought about it second time, obviously you would you would take Risha because you know you're on an island. There's the basic problems like where do you find the food, and I just say Risha, go find some food. Uh, how do you get? How do you construct a raft? You know, and to to escape. And I, I don't know how to construct a raft, but I would I would depend. You know, Risha would figure it out. Give him a week. He'd have the biggest baddest raft you've ever seen. So yeah, I, I'm going to nominate Richard too. Oh, I love that. I love that. I want to remind everybody, we have signed copies. Murder by the Book has signed copies of Better Off Dead. So order, I'm going to pop the link into the comments, order a signed copy from this woman-owned independent books, bo bookstore. Vote with your wallet, y'all, and get your signed copy tonight. Also, we're coming up on holiday season. I can't believe it's November. So the perfect gift for the mystery lover in your life, a signed Jack Reed your book. So I just popped the link into the comments. So grab that one for yourself, one for a friend, um, a perfect gift for yourself and for others, everybody. A signed copy. I love having my books signed. Um, let's get back to the writing process. Andrew and Lee, which was each of your favorite scene to write in this book? And which is your favorite scene to read in this book? Well, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to react purely as a as a reader because um, I don't feel comfortable in saying uh, once once you know, one scene I wrote or whatever came out any good. I've always been I mean, seriously, as a matter of literary theory, I believe that the book is essentially created by the reader. Um, it's like a Zen proposition: a book is written, then it is read, then it exists. And the reader creates it as much as, as the writer. And speaking as a reader of this book, that um, first chapter, which came in to me as a surprise, I, I, and I just thought that is slick and perfect. And um, I mean, clearly there was an undercurrent that was supposed to let me know what was going on as a reader, but you panic. You think, yeah, but that might be a double bluff. And so as a reader, yeah, the, the first, the, the opening just really convinced me. It really, I, I thought, yeah, that is a solid, solid book that we're going to have because how could it not be opening from that position? Well, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that because I would have to pick that chapter too. And I think really because it was the most you know, probably the most ambitious thing I'd ever tried to put on the page. And when I started it, I had no idea if it would work. I thought it might be, you know, a bridge too far. I thought I might, the idea might not hold up or that I might not be able to execute it properly. So um, I took the risk and, um, and to, to hear that it, it, it got close to hitting the mark, you know, that's, 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 that's music to my ears. I love that. Oh, I love that too. I love that too. Well, I see we are almost out of time. I want to thank you both so much for your time. Leech is saying um, that your book sounds so very intriguing and she loves this cover. The cover is so great. Orange is, I think, my favorite color. So I love this cover too, Alicia. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for being with us tonight and listening. Andrew and Lee, 
thank you both for this for this time for this honesty for this authenticity for this insight um any parting words that you'd like to leave with us um a one i want to make sure i get all the comments deb saying thank you for the great discussion tonight sarah lee and andrew gail saying thank you all patty saying mr child and mr child thank you for all of the hours of entertainment your writing has given me and my husband oh patty i love that thank you for being here george George saying thank you both. Uh, Jim saying wonderful interview. Thank you. Wilmer saying thank you for answering my questions. Joining us from Houston, Texas tonight. Wilmer, thank you for joining us. Um, Andrew and Lee, any parting words? Oh, hey, Katie Horn. She said this has been wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Um, Andrew and Lee, parting words, parting thoughts, pearls of wisdom, something you wish I'd asked. How would you like to leave us tonight? Well, you know, when I started in this business, uh, in the mystery world, it was... Um, there were, I would say, in terms of independent bookstores, the majority were women-owned. And Ooh. they have, obviously, a lot of fallen by the wayside in terms of individual stores. But still, the by and large, the greatest uh, independents are run by women, uh, owned by women. Uh, and a lot of the content in terms of what's in them that's really good by now is um, written by women. And I've been waging this campaign for like 10 years now. Real men read women because there is this appalling thing that goes on. I mean, I hate men because, first of all, we suffer because there's a masculine thing that says uh, fiction is not worth it. They would rather read about a sort of dead president from 200 years ago than read Jack Reacher. And, I, and they think they're going to learn more that way. Absolutely wrong. You're going to learn more about reality by reading a Reacher book than reading a history book. And in general, men are terrible, they're terribly difficult to get reading, whereas women give everything a chance. And I really respect that. And I've benefited from that hugely. The, the Reacher series was essentially created by women, r women readers and certainly women publishers. And so that is my message. Real men read books by women. And if you want to dispute that with me, have at it. I write, I write Reacher. Who's going to win? I am loving this. This is fantastic. Andrew, over to you. What about you, sir? Well, you know, similar similar note, but I would I would loop right back to what you said at the beginning of the show, where you said that uh, you know you guys partner with Murder by the Book because you know um, independents need the money, Amazon not so much. So you know, keep buying books and keep buying them from the independents. That's what I would say. Yes, 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 absolutely. Thank you. You know, I think I've come to think of voting is not something that happens once, you know, every four years or once every two years. Voting is something that happens every time you swipe your credit card. You are voting for the books you want to see on the shelves. You're voting for the authors you want to see on the shelves. You're voting for the bookstores you want to see survive. You're voting for the businesses you want to see survive. So if you want to see independent bookstores survive and thrive and you want to have aisles to browse and books to smell and read and hold and bookstore owners to talk about books and recommend books for you. You got to vote with your wallet. So order your signed copy of Better Off Dead tonight. Again, a perfect gift for, uh, for the mystery lover in your life or yourself. Take care. Give yourself a, the gift of reading um, and support a woman-owned bookstore. And thank you both for supporting uh, this bookstore, for being with us tonight, for uh, making sure they have signed copies. You're amazing. Thank you for spending this time with me. And thank you to all of you, mystery and thriller fans, for tuning in tonight. I've popped the comment in the links one more time. So grab your books tonight. Lee Child, Andrew Child, thank you both. You're amazing. And I am leaving this with my mind full of information and my heart full um, from this wonderfully nourishing and informative conversation. So thank you so much. And we'll see you when your next book comes out. You'll come back. Okay. Bless you. All right. Have a great night, y'all. I'll see you next week for hashtag mystery Monday because you know Mondays can be murder. <laughs>